The Earth is officially classified as an oblate spheroid, meaning that it's bulging at the equator and it's flattened out at the poles. Here's a short clip with Neil deGrasse Tyson. So Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning, and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere, it's, an, it's oblate, and officially it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. It's like pear-shaped. It's like pear-shaped. So apparently it's a pear-shaped oblate spheroid. Sounds fine to me, but there seems to be issues when NASA puts out images of the Earth. They're always perfect spheres, and some of these are claimed to be single shots. Not only that, but the images that NASA gives us are never really consistent. Here's three separate NASA images of the Earth, and North America is a different size on each one. Come to find out that NASA photoshops their images using CGI composites. In 2002, Blue Marble 2.0, NASA's Rob Simmon made this. And it had wide appeal too. For example, it ended up as the default background on the iPhone. So the land layer here comes from the Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer aboard Terra. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it was a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just hit Command-Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. It, what I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. I'm getting results that I like, but I think it's a little bit exaggerated. So I'm, gonna, I'm working on some techniques to try to tone it down a little bit. So here we are in 2018, and we can't trust that we've ever seen a true image of the Earth from a distance. On one hand, we're told that we live on an oblate spheroid, and on the other hand, NASA pumps out cartoon balls that are perfect spheres. Speaking of oblate spheroids and perfect spheres, both of them would have detectable curvature, right? Well, it's not showing up for anyone who tries to find it. Let's jump right to the current world record for long-distance landscape photography. This photo defies the curvature of Earth, even with the heights of both mountains factored in. Okay, so um, since this is all in meters, let me convert this to feet. 4102, that's 13458. Again, that's what uh, Bill said, 13458 was the elevation for the distant mountain range. And from this other place right here, which is at 2820, And just to confirm, yep, 92.51 and change, so 92.52, let's just say, round it up. That's the altitude of the um, photographer. So we go to, let's just go ahead and copy that. Go to the Earth Curve Calculator here, everybody likes to use. And let's say that's the um, height of the observer. 9251.969 and the distance at 440 kilometers away let's do this as kilometers and miles 273.403 273.403 so what is supposed to be hidden According to this, the horizon is at 117.799969 miles away. According to this, if you're here, this is at that altitude, your horizon is going to be at 117.8 miles away. And the target over here should be 16,140.1805 below your ability to see it. So 
let's do something else here. We'll use a little calculator here and see what the difference is. 16140.1805. Subtract the height of the mountain, which was again 13,458.005. So if I'm understanding this correctly, then the top of that mountain range should be 2,682.1755 feet below the curvature. In other words, about a half mile below the ability of the observer to see it. 273 miles away. It's mind-blowing. From point A to point B, the shortest car ride would be eight hours. Here is a picture of the Bolivian salt flats. This is over 4,000 square miles and is called the world's biggest mirror. This place is so flat that it defies the curvature of the earth. There are many instances of people documenting the non-existence of curvature. These are just a couple of my favorites. Another way we know that curvature doesn't exist is because of amateur balloons. This one reached a height of 121,000 feet and you'll notice that the horizon is at eye level. This is inconsistent with a sphere, as you would have to look down to see the horizon as you ascended. Let's watch another high altitude balloon. It's always flat when you're not using a fisheye lens on the camera. Cameras with fisheye lenses force a curve onto the image. This is why we saw curvature in the Felix Baumgartner Red Bull jump. It's a fisheye lens, because a normal lens would have shown a flat horizontal horizon like we saw in the video at 121,000 feet. See, Felix Baumgartner's jump was from 128,000 feet, so that's only a 7,000 foot difference there wouldn't be that drastic of a curve change from no curve to a bunch of curve. See, in a fisheye just makes everything look round. So behind Felix Baumgartner, it's nothing but New Mexico. And I'm pretty sure half the earth or, you know, 75% of the earth isn't covered by New Mexico. So a popular belief that is constantly used as proof for the globe is boats disappearing behind the horizon. But this is actually just an optical illusion. Humans can only see so far. But with super zoom cameras like the Nikon P900, or even just a telescope or some binoculars, you can bring back ships and boats that have appeared to go over the supposed curve of the Earth. Did you know that the word horizon stems from horizontal? The definition of horizontal is as follows. Parallel to the plane of the horizon. At right angles to the vertical. Synonyms. Level. Flat. Plain. Smooth. Even. Alright, it's called a horizon, not a curvizon. Now let's have a look at the characteristics of water. Water always finds its level and always ends up perfectly flat when undisturbed. It's one of the easiest things to understand. No experiment on Earth has ever replicated curved water like which is supposedly on the spinning bull Earth. You know who else knew that water doesn't curve? The ancients. As you can see here, we have the Egyptian, Norse, Hindu, Mayan, Inca, Navajo, Greek, and Hebrew depictions of a flat Earth. These are the cosmologies that they knew. It wasn't all that long ago that everyone knew, with certainty, that the Earth was flat and motionless. They also knew that we are enclosed by the firmament, and that we have a local sun and moon that circle above us. You see the sun and the moon inside the firmament in most of these depictions. So is there any credence to this idea? The answer is yes. 
There are many times just like this when the sun shows us how close it actually is. Many people admire the beauty of the scene like this, but they never stop and think about what we are seeing. And what we are seeing are sun rays that are telling our eyes that the sun is local. All you have to do is trace the rays back to the source. The sun is right here with us, right above us. This happens all the time. All you have to do is pay attention and think about it logically. Does it look like it's 93 million miles away? The answer is no. One of the things that I struggled with the most when it comes to Flat Earth is, why does the sun rise and set? I couldn't make any sense of it until I realized that the sun was much closer and much smaller than we are told. The sun appears to rise and set due to perspective only. What we are seeing here is the actual path of the sun versus what we see because of human perspective. It seems as if it's rising and setting, but it's just coming and going. It's the sun as well as the moon that do the moving across the sky. The earth is not moving whatsoever. Also, you see here that the sun does, in fact, shrink as it gets further away, but only if the atmospheric conditions are right. When it's really humid, the sun gets magnified. When it's dry out, you pretty much see the sun for its true size as it comes and goes. Now let's talk about the moon. Here's a normal moon in the night sky. We are told that the moon is 238,000 miles away. The funny thing is that the Tycho Crater, which is said to only be 53 miles in radius, is perfectly visible to us from Earth at this distance. So I tried to figure out a way to test if we would be able to see the Tycho Crater from a distance of 238,000 miles away. I went to Google Earth and I made a 53-mile radius in Texas, as you can see here. And you can also do this yourself. Then I zoomed out as far as I could, and unfortunately, it only goes to 39,000 miles away, but it still makes the point, in my opinion. You can barely see the 53-mile radius from 39,000 miles away. If I were to go another 200,000 miles out, we surely would not be able to see the red circle anymore. Of course, Google Earth is complete nonsense. Let's watch a quick clip in reference to Google Earth. All right, here's what looks like an objective image of the world. This is Google Earth, um, and it's a circular image, so it gets around the big problem of trying to portray uh, the, the world on a flat surface. Now, you have a lot of reservations, don't you, about Google Earth? Uh, yet, to many people, it's a wonderful application. It is great technology, and that's what I first thought when I started doing the work on it. But I don't, do now think that because of the way in which they have bought up so much of the data, which they fed into this um, geospatial application, is what they call it, um, they are monopolizing maps online. If you go online and you're using maps, you are probably using a Google map. And there's also some sort of sinister and worrying dimensions to Google because they buy Earth Viewer, which is the application, um, and that is funded by the CIA. We'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. William Casey, director of the CIA in 1981. The CIA's whole purpose is to dispense propaganda and disinformation. So anyway, we were talking about the moon and how being able to see Tycho Crater doesn't make sense. Now let's look at an image of the moon during the day. Now just think about this. Why would we ever see the moon during the day? I mean, if it's 238,000 miles deep into the darkness of outer space, how does it show up in our blue sky? The answer again is because it's local, just like the sun, just like the ancients depicted in their models, and just like many flat earthers propose today. To be fair, we are not sure of the exact layout and model, but we do know two things for sure. The Earth is a level plane, and it doesn't move at all. Everything after that, we are still trying to figure out. How do lunar eclipses work, you ask? Well, certainly not like we are told. We see the shadow of Earth on the moon, and it appears to be round. Therefore, we live on a ball. 
But whatever is causing the shadow on the moon, we don't even know. It's not the Earth. There's been so many instances of lunar eclipses where the sun and the moon are both above the horizon while the eclipse is taking place. Look it up for yourself. It's called a selenillion. And you can find websites that, that'll tell you. There, I'll show you one right here. What makes October 8th lunar eclipse so special? It's an impossible occurrence. It says, on Wednesday early morning, those watching the sky in North America will be able to witness the most unique total lunar eclipse yet. Though lunar eclipses happen twice a year, you might be upset to miss this one, as this rare type of eclipse will occur while the sun is still up. Now, how is the Earth causing the shadow on the moon if the sun is still up above the horizon with the moon? In an old book by F.H. Cook called The Terrestrial Plane, it says this, According to the globular theory, a lunar eclipse occurs when the sun, earth, and moon are in a direct line. But it is on record that since about the 15th century, over 50 eclipses have occurred while both sun and moon have been visible above the horizon. Now, let's have a look at the stars. When you look at the time-lapse videos of the stars, they all move uniformly. This might make sense on a spinning globe if the only thing we were doing was spinning. However, mainstream science not only tells us that the Earth is spinning at 1,000 miles per hour, but we are also told that we orbit around the Sun at 67,000 miles per hour. In addition to that, our solar system, Earth and all, rolls around the centre of the galaxy at 490,000 miles per hour. And finally, the entire Milky Way galaxy is travelling through space at over 1 million miles per hour. Keep in mind that none of these motions have ever been proven, not even Earth's supposed rotation. With all of these motions considered, is this what we would see night after night for thousands of years? No. They also tell us that the stars are distant suns, but they look like orbs of dancing energy when you zoom in on them with a high power zoom camera. And considering how far away they are, should we even be able to zoom into them in the first place? Now let's talk about planets. People always ask me, why is Earth the only planet that's flat? And it's simple, really. It's because Earth is not a planet. Planets were known to the ancients as wandering stars. Let's have a look at the etymology of the word. This is from the online etymology dictionary. Wandering stars. See, that's what you need to pay attention to. Wandering stars. That's what these were called, planets. And we weren't a c considered a wandering star. Now let's keep going. From planistai to wander, so called because they have apparent motion unlike the fixed stars, originally included also the sun and moon. Okay, so they move in a completely different way than the regular uniform stars that all move the exact same, originally included the sun and moon. Also, Earth was originally not included because it's not a planet, it's a plane. You can find the planets of the universe encoded in our weekdays. Sunday is Sun. Monday is Moon. Tuesday is Mars. Wednesday is Mercury. Thursday is Jupiter. Friday is Venus. Saturday is Saturn. All seven wandering stars are accounted for. You're probably wondering about Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. Well, as you may know, Pluto was demoted from planet status in 2006 and there is much debate online as to whether Uranus and Neptune should even be considered. If not, then we are back at six planets, but that's including the Earth. Take away the Earth because it's not a planet and add the Sun and Moon back in, and we're back at the original seven planets. Now let's have a look at what we are told the solar system looks like. Central Sun, hence heliocentric, and the planets all going around it. Now just like pictures of the Earth, you can't find any real pictures of the so-called solar system. Here's what you get when you do a search for real pictures of the solar system. A bunch of cartoons. The argument is that we just can't go out far enough and take pictures of the solar system, bro. It's not that simple. Well, I beg to differ. NASA claims to have the Hubble telescope taking real pictures of distant galaxies. Here's one right here. Look up spiral galaxy pair NGC 
and NGC 4298, but they tell us that the Hubble is only 350 miles away, so maybe we can't get pictures of our solar system with Hubble. Well, what about the Discover satellite with the epic camera? They claim that it took this shot of Earth from 1 million miles away. If that's the case, can't they just zoom back a little bit and snap the solar system? Again, the fact is that everything we get from NASA is CGI. Start looking at it and examining it. You'll notice. Is the Earth a planet? The answer is no. It's never been proven. Just programmed into us. We have to stop looking up at the lights in the sky for answers, because we are not one of those lights. The Earth is special and so are you. We are at the centre of all things, and the only life is here. Outer space is one big lie. Yeah, you can look up at the night sky and see the stars and wandering stars, but it's not what we are told it is. You can't travel there, and there is no such thing as deep space. NASA admits repeatedly that we can't go into deep space because we no longer have the 60s technology that we used to get to the moon. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. The kinds of technologies that we're testing out on space station are definitely helping us with our goals of going beyond low Earth orbit. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. And this is really the beginning, I think, of human beings leaving low Earth orbit. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. I haven't uh, uh, seen anything that indicates the telemetry data is even in existence. And as I said, even if we had it, we don't have the machines to play it back. Unfortunately, I'm afraid I can't really give you much of a clue as to, as to where this data ended up and whether it, it still exists or not. See? Can't go past low Earth orbit. That equals can't get past the barrier, also known as the dome or the firmament. If you look up how many people have been to space, here's what you get. Of the 536, three people completed only a suborbital flight. 533 people reached Earth orbit, 24 travelled beyond low Earth orbit, and 12 walked on the moon. So it seems the Apollo mission was the only one to ever get to deep space. You would think that by now, we'd have several bases on the moon and would have already been to Mars a few times. But no. And let me just say that we were discussing how the moon is local, so naturally, you're probably wondering why we can't go. Well, the thing is, is that none of this stuff is what we are told it is. There are documented cases of being able to see stars through the moon. So this begs the question, is the moon even a physical object? It was also documented in the Royal Society of Philosophical Transactions from 1974. It says, An account of an appearance of light, like a star, seen lately in the dark part of the moon. You can download and read the whole PDF from the Royal Society website. This is why we have so many depictions of this throughout the world. But NASA and others maintain that the moon is a physical body that man can land on and visit. But only in the late 60s, early 70s. Let's get back to the Earth and how the spherical Earth paradigm is very new on the timeline of man. Again, here is a few of the cosmologies of the ancients. The people of today have been taught that many of these ancient cultures were primitive and stupid. The fact is, they were more in touch with reality back then. We are completely out of touch with reality and it's by design. So, we have all those. And here we have a 1542 depiction with Earth in the centre followed by the seven planets of the universe, aka the wandering stars, and finally, the firmament. This is also called the crystalline heavens, the place of the fixed stars. This is around the time the Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits, were founded, in 1540. They are largely responsible for the spread of heliocentrism. Notice the sun in their logo. It's because they are sun worshippers and want nothing more than for all of humanity to also worship the sun. Here is what the Earth was depicted like thereafter. This was created by a Jesuit scholar in 1665. 
Yes, the heliocentric globe model of the world has always had its advocates, but these celebrated figures throughout history have almost all been easy to spot Freemasons, and I should note that Freemasonry is a form of Judaism. And the founder of the Jesuits, Ignatius of Loyola, was a crypto-Jew. A crypto-Jew is a Jew who converts to another religion and outwardly embraces the new religion, while secretly maintaining Jewish practices. While all these Freemasons and Jesuits were pushing the heliocentric model of the Earth, many people were saying, wait a minute, what's this about? The Earth is provably flat and motionless. You can find several well-written books with amazing insight on why the heliocentric theory is false and why the static plane is the truth, and these books kept coming well into the 1900s. We have Zetetic Astronomy from 1865, Is the Bible from Heaven, Is the Earth a Globe from 1890, and that one was written by the guy who made the now famous Gleason's map, which is a flat earth map. We have Zetetic Cosmogony from 1899, Terra Firma, Earth Not a Planet from 1901, and so on. If you go to the website archive.org, you can find all of these and many more to download for free. Here's a flat earth map in Samuel Robotham's book Zetetic Astronomy. Here's Alexander Gleason's flat earth map one of the most popular to this day. Here's one from a Flat Earth advocate named William Carpenter. You see that they all look very similar as far as layout of the land. We have the known countries and continents in the middle, surrounded by Antarctica, which is not a continent, but a perimeter of ice. Now, we don't know for sure if this map is accurate, but I personally believe there is something to all of this. If you research Operation High Jump and Operation Deep Freeze, you'll see that a lot was going on in Antarctica during the 1940s and 50s. Admiral Richard E. Byrd was leading numerous expeditions there. Conveniently enough, in 1959 the Antarctic Treaty was established, just one year after NASA was created. And the treaty puts Antarctica off limits to normal people. You can only go if you and your reasons are approved by the proper authorities. Another way you may be able to go is on a guided tour. Why is it that the countries of the world are constantly at war with each other, but they will all adhere to the Antarctic Treaty without any issues? Well, that's because all the world is a stage. The said poles of the Earth, whether south or north, are surrounded by strangeness. While the Antarctic is out of bounds for the public, the North Pole is said to not have any land, just a floating ice sheet that expands and contracts from season to season, What's interesting is that the North Pole was often depicted with land in maps prior to the mid-1600s. I've found several maps with land at the North Pole, including the Mercator North Pole projection. Again, all of these maps are from before the mid-1600s, when all of the sudden, maps that no longer contained the Arctic land were being pumped out. I personally believe that there is still land at the North Pole. Why would they lie about all of this? Well, when you sit down and you really think about it, it's simple. The Big Bang, evolution, spinning ball Earth, chaotically darting through infinite space where eventually our sun will die out, creates the ultimate mind control. This set of beliefs leads to a mentality that nothing matters and everything including you are nothing more than an accident. This is far from the truth. You are very powerful and the ruling class is scared of your potential. This is why people are required to take vaccines and suckered into taking flu shots. This is why they spray chemicals above our heads all day, every day. Chemtrails have several purposes, and some include slow kill of not only the populations, but the soil too, so we can't grow food in the future. All the food will have to come from corporations with employees that have to wear hazmat suits while applying the chemicals that you're going to eat. Nestle wants to own water. All of it. The CEO of Nestle called the idea that water is a human right extreme. And global warming? It's a fallacy. It's a trick put into place to make you think that the polar ice caps are melting and it's your fault. We are completely enslaved programmed and brainwashed by the educational system and the mainstream media, constantly kept in fear and in debt so you can never really stop and think about all of this. It's absolutely appalling all the things they're doing to us. 
Research legal name fraud and crown copyright for proof that birth certificates are merely receipts and that we are unknowingly giving ourselves over to the rulers. Everything that's used against us is to keep us dumbed down and preoccupied so that we can never figure this out and make moves. It's time to wake up. Another reason for lying about the shape of the earth and making it into a ball is because when you turn it into a ball, you can cut off any land you want and keep it hidden. For example, we will take this map, we will cut out a piece, and we will take this flat piece and wrap it around a ball. Now this is where I tell you that this is all there is. You can only go to destinations that are on the globe because you now believe that's all there is. But we still have all the land that I cut off earlier. It's seriously that easy. And when you consider it, it really is a plausible reason to lie. Everything in this world seems to be nothing but lies. And if you're alive right now, you are living in a very exciting time where the truth is being unveiled. Did you know that the word apocalypse actually means to uncover or reveal? Since that's the case, we truly are living in apocalyptic times.